Hello and welcome to Indus News live from Islamabad. I'm Javad Nihami and these are the headlines. Negotiators from the Taliban and the Afghan government have met face to face shortly after peace talks were inaugurated in Doha. Speaking to reporters, special envoy of Qatar's foreign minister, Mutta Al Kahtani, said the two sides sat down to discuss how the talks will proceed. Meanwhile, U.S. Special Envoy Salme Khalidzad said Washington will not provide resources to Kabul if human rights are violated in future. Turkey has strongly condemned Bahrain's decision to establish diplomatic ties with Israel. In a statement, the foreign ministry said the deal will further encourage Israel to continue its illegitimate acts towards Palestinians. Earlier, Palestine rejected the U.S. brokered agreement as a betrayal of the Palestinian cause. In France, police have arrested over 150 people as Yellow West protesters returned to the streets in Paris after nearly a six-month break due to COVID-19. Police used tear gas to disperse the protesters who have been rallying despite a resurgence in coronavirus cases. The protests first erupted in 2019 over fuel price rises but grew to cover wider grievances including economic inequality. And in the English Premier League, Arsenal beat Fulham 3-0 at Craven Cottage to start their campaign with a win. Frenchman Alexander Lacazette scored the opening goal for Gunners in just the eighth minute. Goals from Gabriel and Pierre Emerick Aboumiang in the second half sealed the game for Arsenal. the headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back and now for the news in detail. Negotiators from the Taliban and the Afghan government have met face to face shortly after peace talks were inaugurated in Doha. Speaking to reporters, Special Envoy of Qatar's Foreign Minister, Muttaq Al Qatani, said the two sides sat down to discuss how the talks will proceed. Meanwhile, U.S. Special Envoy Zalmay Khalilzad said Washington will not provide resources to Kabul if human rights are violated in future. What in this report? The intra-Afghan talks are a ray of hope to finally bring an end to the nearly two decades of conflict that has caused tens of thousands of casualties. The negotiations have begun only after months of delay over the precondition of prisoners' release in Doha today. Afghanistan's High Council for National Reconciliation head Abdullah Abdullah opened the session with his speech. I am very proud that on behalf of Afghanistan, uh, for opening the peace negotiations, I am here uh, for a very important and historical uh, uh, ceremony. I welcome you all and also on behalf of the uh, president of Afghanistan, I am talking here and I pass his regards to you all. The Taliban say they fulfilled their commitments under the Doha deal signed with the U.S. and expect other parties to follow suit. Mullah Baradar Akhund, who is leading the Taliban team, said a future Afghanistan should have an Islamic system. And also in this uh, uh, ceremony, I request and I hope that uh, both sides pay attention to the provisions of uh, holy religion of Islam and uh, for getting to this very important purpose. Uh, we should pay attention to the benefits of all, not to the uh, benefits of uh, just uh, some people. Pakistan has played a key role in the peace process for the neighboring country. Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi said after Afghanistan, Pakistan suffered the most due to the war. He said all must be aware of the peace spoilers at this important junction. Spoilers from the day and from the dark will pose formidable 
challenges. Constant vigilance will be required to guard against their machinations. We hope all sides will honor their respective commitments and remain unflinchingly committed to achieving a positive outcome. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has expressed hope that all sides enjoy cooperation with neighbors. You will write the next chapter in Afghan history. We hope this chapter is one of reconciliation and progress, not another chronicle of tears and bloodshed. We urge you to make decisions that move away from the violence and the corruption and towards peace and development and prosperity. The talks are aimed at finding a political settlement in Afghanistan that not only will sustain the peace in the country, but will also accomplish cooperation and connectivity in the region. Pakistan has once again warned against spoilers who didn't want to see a durable peace in Afghanistan. In his virtual address at the opening session of the talks, Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi said these spoilers will pose formidable challenges to the peace process. Or in this report by our correspondent Isa Nakvi from Islamabad. After decades of war and suffering, there seems to be a ray of hope. Along the way, there have been obstacles and setbacks, as well as moments of doubt and despair. But the intra-Afghan negotiations have finally begun in Qatar's capital, Doha. The foreign minister pointed out the pivotal role Pakistan played to get to this point. Arriving at this inflection point has been an accomplishment, and this success belongs first and foremost to the Afghans. Pakistan has walked alongside you in every possible way by encouraging reduction in violence and by urging dialogue and negotiations. Qureshi said that Afghans alone must be the masters of their destiny. Calling for vigilance, he said there should be no outside influence or interference. Spoilers from within and from without will pose formidable challenges. Constant vigilance will be required to guard against their machinations. Experts believe some regional powers, including India, want to sabotage the peace process in Afghanistan. There are external factors who are trying to influence the course of events and uh, primarily a number of neighbors of Afghanistan, I think, who find themselves as uh, having become irrelevant. If you monitor the situation very closely, you would observe that every time there is a forward movement in Afghan peace process, there is a spoiler which comes in between. And every time the spoiler is no one else but India. They say it is a decisive moment in the history of the region and would usher in a new era of peace for South Asia and beyond. Reporting for Indus News, Isa Nakvi, Islamabad. And for more on this, we are joined by former diplomat Ayaz Wazir from Islamabad. Thank you for your time at Indus News. Sir, the intra-Afghan talks between Kabul and the Taliban have started in Doha today. So do you think these negotiations can lead to a durable regional peace? Well, uh, this is the only way of uh, bringing durable peace to Afghanistan because this is the first time in the 40 or 42 years of the conflict in Afghanistan that the Afghans, the two warring sides, are uh, meeting on Monday in, in Doha. The formal part was done today. And uh, then the Afghan, the inter afghan dialogue will begin and they will try to sort out the problems and bring in a future government which is acceptable to all under which the Taliban and the Afghan government and every Afghan is, is uh, happy with that. Otherwise, if it is one side taking over or the other side taking over, then the differences would uh, deepen. But uh, to your question, yes, this is uh, certainly going to uh, bring a permanent peace to Afghanistan, provided leaders of both the sides uh, uh, are prepared to make sacrifices for the sake of uh, the country or for the sake of the nation to take it out of the conflict that uh, 
they have been saying during for so long. Mr. Wazir, Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi asked the Doha meeting to identify the peace spoiler. So will this junction be successful in pointing out such elements and take countermeasures? Well, I think they know the spoilers, uh, and uh, they would certainly be uh, prepared for tackling that issue because the spoilers within Afghanistan and outside of Afghanistan, without naming the country, we all know which country would love to uh, derail it because that country is deeply entrenched in Afghanistan and uh, trying to uh, destabilize our western border. But the two sides are both aware of it. The Taliban know it certainly, and the Afghan government is also aware of this sensitivity. So they have to take care of the militants group within Afghanistan not to destabilize, and the outside countries that are interested in playing their own games within Afghanistan not to derail it, because this is the, this is the best opportunity for them to bring peace to the country. And that element they have to guard against together because the spoiler certainly would uh, use every tactic uh, to derail. So, Mr. Wazid, U.S. Special Envoy Zalmay Khalilzad has said it will be hard for the U.S. to provide resources to Afghanistan if human rights are violated in future. So, what do you think about it? Well, obviously, this is uh, a, a reference, I would say, indirectly to the uh, in my assessment, to the establishment of the Taliban government like it was uh, before, or to refuse the uh, human rights uh, of the individuals like the women's rights and, and others. Uh, but the Taliban are aware of it. Uh, uh, they, they have to accommodate uh, uh, the other side also, and the other side is also aware of it that alone they cannot. Alone, no one, neither the Taliban or the Afghan government can run the entire country. They have to, if I can use the word, mesh together, to get together, to form a government which is acceptable to both sides, to women, to human rights, to activists. Uh, that is the only way of bringing peace to Afghanistan. But people are there, certainly, using, you would be using every avenue to derail it in the name of, say, like making the people scared of the Taliban are coming to take over the driving seat, or the other side to make them scared that the uh, government is taking over. The, so uh, the, the Afghan, I'm sure, this time are aware of it. They both both the sides are tired of, of fighting. The Taliban are tired. They want to bring peace to the country. The Afghan government side is also tired of the killing in their country, want to bring peace. So they have to guard against, and if they fail to guard against, that would be too unfortunate then. Mr. Ayaz Wazir, former diplomat, thank you very much for your time at Indus News. We really appreciate that. Now, moving on, the major world organizations and blocs are calling for a humanitarian resolution of Afghan war. This comes as the intra-Afghan negotiations between Kabul and the Taliban began in Qatar's capital city of Doha. The United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has called for redoubling the efforts to safeguard Afghan civilians. Elsewhere, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation had, has called for an immediate end to violence in Afghanistan. NATO Secretary General said Afghan peace talks are the best chance for peace and the world should embrace them wholeheartedly. He said Afghanistan is no longer a safe haven for international terrorists. Meanwhile, European Union has urged all parties to agree to an unconditional ceasefire in Afghanistan. Pakistan has urged the ASEAN members to raise voice against the rising Islamophobia and extremist tendencies in the region. Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi said this in his video remarks at the 27th ASEAN Regional Forum held online. In an apparent reference to India's illegal occupation of Kashmir, Qureshi warned against altering the demographics of disputed territories. The Foreign Minister also emphasized Pakistan's commitment to interfaith harmony. He said Islamabad took the big step of opening the Qatarpur corridor last year to facilitate Sikh pilgrims from India and elsewhere. More stories to follow, but right after a short break, stay tuned.
Welcome back. Turkey has strongly condemned Bahrain's decision to establish diplomatic ties with Israel. In a statement, the foreign ministry said the deal will further encourage Israel to continue its illegitimate acts towards Palestine. It said the move will deal a fresh blow to the efforts to defend the Palestinian cause. Iran also decried the deal and termed the agreement as shameful and a humiliating act. The foreign ministry said Palestinians and Muslims worldwide will never accept the normalization of ties with Israel. Earlier, Palestine rejected the U.S. brokered agreement as a betrayal of the Palestinian cause. It recalled its ambassador to Bahrain to discuss the aftermath of the agreement. The U.N. says Israel has raised 389 Palestinian-owned houses in the occupied West Bank from March to August, the highest average in the last four years. In a statement, the U.N. Human Humanitarian Office said the destruction left 442 Palestinians homeless. It said this huge displacement of people further exposed them to risks associated with COVID-19 pandemic. UN official Jamie McGoldrick said the destruction of property in an occupied territory is prohibited under international law. The Israeli authorities routinely raise homes of the Palestinian on their own lands in annexed East Jerusalem or the West Bank. The Iranian army says it has intercepted three intruding U.S. spy aircrafts during the ongoing naval and air exercises. In a statement, Iran's military said the drones left the air defense zone after the locally manufactured Qarar was launched. It said the drones were given multiple warnings before they were chased away by Qarar aircraft. Tehran is holding military exercises near the strategically vital Strait of Hormuz and Sea of Oman. Iran says three-day-long drills called Zulifkar 99 aim to prepare the military to defend the country's territorial waters. In France, police have arrested over 150 people as Yellow West protesters returned to the streets in Paris after nearly six-month break due to COVID-19. Police used tear gas to disperse the protesters who have been rallying despite a resurgence in coronavirus cases. Authorities called on demonstrators to respect sanitary measures in the capital. The protests first erupted in 2019 over fuel price rises, but grew to cover wider grievances, including economic inequality. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has urged Conservative MPs to back his plan to override part of the Brexit withdrawal agreement. The European Union has warned the UK it can face legal action if it does not ditch controversial elements of the internal market bill. In an online video call with around 250 parliament members, Johnson said the Conservatives must not return to miserable squabbling over Europe. A Tory MP proposed an amendment to the bill which will affect trade between Britain and Northern Ireland. Meanwhile, the European Parliament has threatened to drain any of the trade deal if the bill becomes the UK law. The next official round of talks, the 9th since March, will start in Brussels on September the 28th. All four police officers accused of killing African-American George Floyd appeared before the court together for the first time. At the Hennepin County District Court, the defense lawyers called for separate hearings well, the prosecution asked for a consolidated trial. The prosecution said the accused former cops acted together while well, the nature of charges and the evidence was also similar. The prosecution said it will be impossible to evaluate any individual defendant's conduct in a vacuum. Floyd's lawyers also refuted assertions that he had died from an overdose of fentanyl uh, rather than cardiopulmonary arrest, the official cause of death. Hennepin County District Court Judge Peter Cahill said he was planning for a trial of six weeks, including two weeks for jury selection. Elsewhere, Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison said the state was a just and professional trial to Floyd and his family. We will not be trying the case in the court of public opinion or the media. It means that we will try the case in the courts of Hennepin County. As we do so, I promise a few things. One, we'll be scrupulously fair. Two, we will meet 
uh, all of our professional and ethical responsibilities. And three, we will work as hard as humanly possible. This is how we will achieve a just outcome. That's the obligation we owe George Floyd and his family and this community. Earlier in June, the main accused, Derek Chauvin, was charged with second-degree murder and third-degree manslaughter, while the other three were accused of abetting the crime. Now, moving on, India has recorded the world's highest daily jump of over 97,000 coronavirus cases and more than 1,200 fatalities overnight. The country's infections have crossed a 4.65 million mark, with the death toll reaching 77,472. The virus has claimed more than 915,000 lives and infected over 28.4 million people across the globe. More than this report. The coronavirus pandemic has re-emerged in parts of the world, straining governments and their efforts to contain the disease. Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orban says his government is drafting a war plan to counter the second wave of the pandemic. England's case count is doubling every seven to eight days as the government reminded public to play their role to keep the virus at bay. France has ruled out imposing a new lockdown to contain the resurgence, but said will implement a raft of less radical measures. In the face of this epidemic, our strategy is not changing. Fighting against the virus while avoiding to have to put on hold our social, cultural and economic lives, the education of our children and our capability to live normally. Canada has reported zero COVID-19 deaths in the past 24 hours for the first time since March 15th. In Latin America, the confirmed coronavirus death toll in Mexico has surpassed 70,000 after the government reported 534 new deaths overnight. Meanwhile, the Brazilian state of Bahia has signed an agreement to conduct phase three clinical trials of Russia Sputnik V vaccine. The government of Bahia signed a memorandum of understanding with the Russian government, with the Russian company responsible for the development of Sputnik V vaccine. And we signed a confidentiality agreement to have access to sensitive information about the development of this vaccine. COVID-19 deaths in Australia reached 803, but new daily infections in the country's largest hotspot of Victoria continued to fall. South Korea's new cases stayed below 200 for the 10th day in a row, but health authorities remain wary about no let-ups in sporadic cluster infections. In Pakistan, three people have died from COVID-19 in the last 24 hours, bringing the country's death toll to 6,307. The health ministry says 584 people tested positive for the virus overnight. Is that the country has 6,046 active cases, while total reaches almost 301,000. The ministry said over 288,000 people have recovered so far. Sindh remains the most affected province with over 131,000 infections, while Punjab has reported more than 97,000 cases so far. Balochistan has over 13,000 reported cases, while the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa has over 36,000 infections. Pakistan's southwestern province of Balochistan, opulent in oil, gas and minerals, stipulates the country with an exclusive economic zone. Balochistan coast extends over 750 kilometers from Hub to Gawada, giving the region an extensive strategic rank along with an international level of port activity. What in this special report by our correspondent Sumera Khan from Gawadar. Sandy beaches and rocky shores along the Makran coast have stimulated attraction for tourists worldwide. The new highways augmented telecommunication, an international port and improved security milieu boosted the urbanization in the region, particularly in Gawadar. In terms of the contact between the people of Gawadar and other parts of the world, in terms of exchange of knowledge, the knowledge and information that the people of this area have got and the knowledge of and information that the uh, other parts of the globe have, this is the time for exchange of that information in a highly secure environment. Ongoing development of Makran coastal area through fisheries, tourism, trade and social growth projects supervised by both government and army is proving to be a catalyst for entire Balochistan. This is the place from where the 
benefits of economy, the benefits of maritime connectivity, the benefits of uh, regional connectivity uh, by exploiting its resources, by engaging its youth in different kinds of jobs and uh, industrial base is going to give a lot of boost to the region and uh, to the world. Makran Coastal Highway and M8 under China-Pakistan Economic Corridor have made a huge impact on the economy and socio-politics of southern Balochistan. They have boosted the local businesses of fisheries and tourism as well. While looking at the advanced levels being added to this ancient profession of boat making here at Gawada Boat Basin, it can be easily visualized that Pakistan is entering its soup present while having an eye on future but keeping its past intact. It's not only establishing an international level of port authority but it is also nurturing its ancient skills and its fishermen here. Reporting for Indus News, Sumaira Khan, Gawada City. Sri Lanka Navy says it has fixed a fuel leak from the fire-stricken oil tanker of the island country's east coast. The leaked diesel created a two-kilometer long slick in the Indian Ocean after the huge week-long blaze. In a statement, the Navy said the fuel from the vessel New Diamond was seeping into the water through damaged pipes. Meanwhile, a Dutch salvage company said 270,000 ton of oil cargo was unaffected by the fire. It said the company is working on transferring the crude into another ship. Last week, a Filipino crewman was killed when a boiler on the ship exploded, causing a huge fire. Peru's Congress has voted to open impeachment proceedings against President Martin Vizcarra for moral incapability. 65 members of the Peru's 130-member Congress voted in favor of the move with 36 votes against and 24 abstentions. The Congress is due to debate and vote on the motion in the next week, with 87 votes required to remove Vizcarra from office. Lawmakers allege President tried to obstruct an investigation into nearly $50,000 in government contracts handed to a little-known singer. They say the leaked private recordings suggest Vizcarra was attempting to downplay his meetings with the singer. The President has vowed to fight the charges, saying the move is a plot to destabilize the government. I am not going to resign. The presidency is a responsibility that I assumed with the Peruvian people, and I am a person who keeps his word. I am not going to resign, and I ask the Congress of the Republic to analyze the situation with caution and responsibility. You take the decision that you think best, but I am not going to resign. In September last year, Vizcarra faced a previous attempt to impeach him for incapacity. Now, moving on, Russia has condemned the extension of sanctions by the EU, saying the bloc has missed an opportunity to normalize ties. In a press conference, Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova said Brussels continues its accusatory rhetoric instead of trying to look for common ground. The spokesperson also slammed the new U.S. sanctions on three Russians over allegations of interfering in the election campaign. Zakharova says such actions will not give the result Washington is looking for. Early, the EU officially extended its sanctions on the Russian finance, energy and defense sectors for another six months. The measures include travel restrictions and freezing of assets targeting 175 people and 44 entities. 50 people have died when an artisanal gold mine collapsed in the Democratic Republic of Congo's southern Kivu province. A local mining NGO said the mine site near Kamituga caved in following the heavy rains in the region. The NGO said the young miners were in the tunnel as the mine caved in, trapping the victims inside. Mining accidents are common in the unregulated mines in Congo where miners have to work without proper equipment. In Iran, a wrestler Naveed Afkari has been executed after being convicted of a stabbing a security guard to death during anti-government protests in 2018. The head of Justice Department, Kazim Mosavi, said the legal procedures were carried out at the insistence of the family of the victim. The 27-year-old Greco-Roman wrestler was convicted of killing a water company security guard and other charges. But Afkari's family says he was tortured into making a false confession, while his attorney said there is no proof of his guilt. 
Last week, a global union representing 85,000 athletes called for Iran's expulsion from the world sports if it executed Afkari. Police on the Greek island of Lesbos fight tear gas at protesting migrants who were left homeless after their camp burned down on Wednesday. Around 13,000 migrants and refugees had been living in Skola in the overcrowded Maria camp and were desperate to leave the island. The protesters chanted slogans of freedom as authorities bolstered efforts to set up temporary accommodation. Despite growing hostility from locals, Greek authorities have refused any mass transfer of the island. Earlier, Germany said 10 EU states have agreed to take 400 unaccompanied minors who fled Greece's largest migrant camp when it was gutted by fire. The first batch of the Sputnik V vaccine against the coronavirus has been shipped to the regions of Russia. Russia's healthcare ministry said it will ensure distribution and organization of vaccination of citizens from the higher risk group. It said the ministry will also ensure the logistics chains for delivering the vaccine to the constituent entities of the Russian Federation. Earlier this week, Russia's healthcare minister, Mikhail Moroskow, announced phase three of clinical trials of the Sputnik V vaccine. Russia became the first country to register the vaccine against the coronavirus on August the 11th. In the Chinese city of Tianjin, a group of senior athletes have become local celebrities for their unique gymnastic skills. What about the acrobats in this report? Older but limber, a group of senior gymnastic enthusiasts are showing their skills in China's Tianjin, becoming celebrities among locals. They hold training sessions in a park and even have a fan club of their own. This is the life Tong Yugin always dreams of to become a gymnastic star. He finally realized his dream in his 70s and has even become the leader of a team of elderly athletes sharing the same ambition. We organized Lao Wen Tong gymnastics team 10 years ago. We felt very boring after retirement and did not know what to do. And so we started practicing gymnastics. The average age of the team is 60 with some senior members in their 80s. They outdo most young athletes by the stunning performances they put on. Combining gymnastics with Chinese acrobatics, they also created some unique performances which takes both courage and years of practice. Don't be bothered by the old age. The elders should have their own ways to take pleasure. You should believe you are still young. That's what I do. The gymnastics team have a fan club of around 30 members, mostly ladies of their age, who often come to watch their skills. The gymnastics team now has over 300 members whose life after retirement seems to be anything but boring. Most stories to follow right after a short break. The U.S. budget deficit has hit a record high of over $3 trillion. In a report, the U.S. Treasury Department said the federal government spent over $6 trillion in the first 11 months of the financial year. The Treasury Department said the government spent $2 trillion on the coronavirus relief efforts. Government data shows the shortfall is more than double from the previous full year record set in 2009 in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. The agency said the total U.S. debt was expected to exceed $26 trillion. Earlier, the Congressional Budget Office said the economy was likely to run a full-year deficit of $3.3 trillion. In the English Premier League, Arsenal beat Fulham 3-0 at Craven Cottage to start their campaign with a win. Frenchman Alexander Lacazette scored the opening goal for Gunners in just the eighth minute. The London side dominated the second half and the lead was doubled when centre-back Gabriel scored from Williams Corner. Pierre Aboumiang then sealed it for Arsenal scoring the third goal for them. Fulham created a few chances in the second half but they remained goalless. Four-time Olympic champion Mo Farah has won the Antrim Coast Half Marathon held on Northern Ireland's scenic coastline. Farah followed up last week's one-hour world record run in Brussels with another impressive display. 
He stretched clear in the closing stages of the race to claim victory in 1 hour and 27 seconds. The 37-year-old finished 12 seconds ahead of Mark Scott with Ben Connor a further back in third. Belfast's Stephen Scullion thrilled the home fans with a superb race in fourth and also broke the Northern Ireland record. In the National Basketball Association, the Boston Celtics beat Toronto Raptors by 92 points to 87 in the playoff game at the NBA's Biosecure Bubble near Disney World in Florida. Celtics have dumped the holders from the seven-game Eastern Conference semifinal series. Boston's power forward Jason Tatum had 29 points and 12 rebounds while shooting guard Jalen Brown scored 21. Toronto's point guard Fred Van Vliet hit 20 points as their title defense ended after coming back from 2-0 and 3-2 down in the series. Earlier Denver Nuggets stunned the Los Angeles Clippers by 111 to 105 in Game 5 of their Western Conference semifinal series. Nuggets shooting guard Jamal Murray scored 26 points with Nikola Jokic at 22 points and 14 rebounds. Another weather situation from around the globe. That's all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Tennis.news.